Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Tullio Iappelli. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Naples. I'm not supposed to present and introduce this um, lecture by um, Helen Ley. It's the 14th lecture on money and finance. This is a series of lectures that the Bank of Italy organizes every two years to honor former governor Paolo Baffi and his outstanding achievements in research and central banking and as a tribute to his commitment to the public interest. The lecture today is on the international monetary system and the global financial cycles, and we believe it by Helen Ray. Let me introduce Helen by saying that her CV and achievements are impressive. Helen is a great scholar, and her research topics are of great relevance for policymakers. Helen has a PhD from LSC and is a professor of economics at the London Business School. Before that, she was a professor at Princeton University and a lecturer at LSC. She has visited some of the top economic departments, including, among other Northwestern, Chicago, Berkeley, and Harvard. Helen has written over 30 papers on various topics in international money and finance in top economic and finance journals, including the JPE, the AER, the QG, and the Review of Economic Studies. She has been on the editorial board of several journals, including the economic journal GIA and AJ Macro. She has received an impressive number of awards and prizes for her original contributions to international finance, including the Bernasse Prize, Best European Microeconomist under the age of 40, the Birgit Grodal Award of the European Economic Association, the Janssen Award for European Economists under 45 years uh, of age, sharing the prize with Thomas Piketty, and the Maurice Allais Prize. She is a fellow of the Econometric Society, the British Academy, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is the recipient of two ERC, a junior and senior level. This is the most prestigious European grant. Her research focuses on the determinants and consequences of external trade and financial imbalances, the theory of financial crisis, and the organization of the international monetary system. She is perhaps best known for her work on the global financial system and the so-called impossible trinity, and we will hear some of this today. The idea that countries cannot achieve at the same time a fixed exchange rate, no capital controls, and an independent monetary policy. This was the accepted wisdom by international economists, which believed that a country could achieve an independent monetary policy only with floating exchange rates. But the scale of financial globalization calls the theory into question. Given the large co-movements in asset prices and credit, and given that these co-movements are partly induced by US monetary policy, countries are no longer insulated from the rest of the world through flexible exchange rates. Helen has argued that now the world faces a dilemma, not a trilemma, because an independent monetary policy can only be achieved by managing or regulating the capital account or by restricting credit growth and asset bubbles within countries through regulation. In joint work with Olivier Gurinchas, she has stressed that the US has what they call an exorbitant privilege, and also we will hear something about this today, in the world financial market, which however calls also for an exorbitant duty in times of crisis. The privilege is that in normal times, the US earns higher rates of return on its foreign assets than it pays on its foreign liabilities. The duty is that in crisis times, the US receives lower rates of returns on foreign assets than it pays on its foreign liabilities, and therefore transfers resources to the rest of the world. In this and other works, Helen has challenged accepted theories in international finance, combining theory and empirical analysis in a very effective way. Her projects are large scale and long running, while often nowadays we see projects that deliver immediate results, but are also immediately forgotten. 
It is perhaps because her work is so innovative and provocative that she has been invited to give about 30 keynotes and public lectures in the past 10 years in major central banks, conferences, and institutions. Lastly, let me mention that Helen, as a, a CPR vice president, has taken a leading role in improving female representation in the economic profession with the creation of the Women in Economics Initiative, whose aim is to redress gender imbalances in the economic profession. So, Helen, the floor is yours. The lecture is about one hour, and then at the end, you will take questions. And thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Tulio, for this uh, excellent introduction, and which is far too generous. I would also uh, very much like to thank the Banca d'Italia for this uh, great opportunity to address this uh, very distinguished audience. It's a, it's a wonderful honor, and uh, frankly, it's, a, it's an overwhelming experience uh, to give the Paolo Baffi lecture um, because of the incredible distinction of the past uh, uh, lecturers, but also because of the uh, tremendous importance of Paolo Baffi uh, in the history of uh, the Banca d'Italia, uh, not least in, uh, in research, and, and also because of his uh, personality. Uh, he was a hallmark of civil passion and uh, intellectual integrity. As it happens, in, uh, in 1980, uh, Paolo Baffi was asked to write uh, the history of the Bank for International Settlement. And uh, he uh, actually could unfortunately not finish uh, his book about the BIS. Uh, but so today, I will be discussing highly related issues. I will be discussing the international monetary system and its future. So I'm going to be uh, now going into the topic of the lecture, which is about global financial cycle and the international monetary system. And this lecture uh, will build on the work I've done over many years. Uh, it has been alluded to by, by Tulio with many uh, co-authors, uh, whom I thank very much for their collaboration uh, over the years. So, uh, in, this, uh, in the lecture, what I am intending to, to try to cover today is first to discuss uh, the dollar hegemony and uh, its implications in various dimensions, in particular the process of external adjustment of countries, but also the impact of the global financial cycles on domestic financial system and on macroprudential policy. And I will also look at whether the current international monetary system is stable or not in its architecture. I will argue maybe not. And therefore, I will also try to think about the future of that system and what type of uh, challenges we might see emerging. So this is the menu. And let's start with the uh, dollar hegemony. So here this is Bretton Woods in New Hampshire. And what uh, we have seen is that the dollar has been pretty much dominant on the international scene, at least uh, since 1944. And we see it in very many different measures. We see it in uh, global trade. We see it in cross-border financial flows. Uh, we see it in the vehicle currency role of the dollar in international financial markets. Uh, we see it because uh, the dollar is an anchor in the international monetary system with a lot of currencies being fixed to the dollar uh, with uh, exchange rate peg. And we also see it because a lot of international reserves are obviously also in dollar. This has not changed since we've gone from the Bretton Woods system after 1973 to a system of floating exchange rate, okay, after the, the collapse of Bretton Woods. Now, maybe that's a good thing uh, that the dollar is, is dominant, and that's certainly something that Charlie Kindleberger here would argue uh, with his famous theory of hegemonic stability. For the world economy to be stable, it needs a stabilizer, so some country at the center that can undertake to provide a market for distressed goods, a steady flow of capital, a rediscount mechanism to provide liquidity when the monetary system is frozen in panic. So having a global liquidity provider, very dominant also in goods market, is a stabilizing force. This is good for the world economy. This also brings some um, 
benefits for the hegemon, that is to say the United States, which is issuing the, the dollar, in different shapes. What are these benefits? Well, one benefit is international seniorage, simply because a lot of people use the dollar. Another one in the stabilization of the terms of trade. Think about the oil market and the commodities market, which are in dollar, priced in dollar. A very important one might be geopolitical power, which comes with, you know, if you provide liquidity in crisis time, that, that gives a lot of power. The extended jurisdiction of the dollar area, which the US has been making a lot of use of uh, recently, as we have seen with Iran, for example, the sanctions on, on, on Iran and various financial players which have been sanctioned, which, has been, which had been going through the dollar in their international transactions. But something that is also really important is that if you have a global liquidity provider, that also means that a lot of people are very keen to absorb your, or to have your liabilities, to have your, to have dollar debt, to have US treasuries. So it's very, very easy for you to borrow abroad in any time, essentially. So that means you have a relatively soft external budget constraint. And for the French, that meant you have a privilege exorbitant, uh, which has caused over the years a lot of geopolitical frustrations, um, in particular in the 1960s, where you can see here the General de Gaulle, uh, who has uh, pointed exactly to that, to that fact, to this soft budget constraint issue. This unilateral facility that the United States has implies that the dollar is not an impartial means of international exchange since it is a means of issuing credit for one state. So this is actually a very, uh, a very important point. And despite the best efforts of General de Gaulle, who contributed to the collapse of, of Bretton Woods, <laughs> If we fast forward from the 60s to 2018 here with the latest ECB report on international role of currencies, what you can still see is that despite the collapse of Bretton Woods, the role of the dollar has not gone down in uh, the main international currency functions. So if we look at international debt issuance, you see the blue bars are the dollar and the yellow bars are euro. The rest in green is the Japanese yen and tiny red bits are the RMB. So you see there is a big asymmetry whether you look at inter international debt, international loans, foreign exchange turnover, payment, where the euro is actually a close second there, but if you look at reserves, again, there is a big dominance of, of the US dollar. If we look at more detailed data, so here this is the data of uh, invoicing, trade invoicing in imports and, in, and exports invoiced in dollars for various countries. You see that if you are close to two, it means 100% of your export and 100% of your imports are in dollar. Okay, so that's why it's you have some numbers close to two here. See that in Latin America, it's no, not rare that a lot of the countries have actually almost all their exports and their imports invoiced in US dollar. And uh, there's a number of countries also in Asia, which are very much in the dollar zone. The countries which are maybe less in the dollar zones are the European countries, which you can see at the, at the very right here of, uh, of this graph. Now, why is it that uh, the dollar covers all this role and has, has remained a very important currency uh, for so many years? Well, it's partly due to a phenomenon that has been analyzed over the years by people like Peter Kennan, but also by Paul Krugman, and who have pointed out that all these international currency roles, if you think about the international trade role, if you think about the financial market role, all these liquidity issues, they are reinforcing with one another. Think about, um, for example, the role of a currency as a unit of account in the official sector, which is, for example, having an exchange rate peg. You are pegging your currency, you are fixing your currency vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar. Well, you may want to do that because there's a lot of trade which is invoiced in dollars, so that decreases your, um, your, your risk vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, variations in for trade flows and investments. You can, you can better do some transactions, minimizing transaction costs if you're pegging to the US dollar, for example. Uh, 
But if you do that, that means you're gonna have to have international reserves in dollar. So of course you're gonna hold reserves in dollars. So you're gonna intervene on foreign exchange markets in dollar. So that also means that the liquidity of foreign exchange markets in dollar is gonna be greater than in other currencies. And therefore the private sector will have also more incentives to use dollars because markets are more liquid. So you have all these combining factors, complementary factors, which mean that these various functions of currency, medium of exchange, total value, unit of account, they go with each other. And when an equilibrium is, is there, like the dollar equilibrium, it's gonna be very hard to change because very few people have an incentive to deviate. If you deviate, you're gonna pay a lot of transaction costs, you're gonna face illiquid markets, et cetera, et cetera. So you're not deviating. And you need pretty big disruptions, pretty big shock to deviate. Okay, it did happen in history because we did transition from the pound sterling as the main international currency to the US dollar, but it took a few big, big change, big changes in the world economy to get there, right? So what are the consequences of having the dollar as a main international currency? Well, one thing that you know, comes from that, in a straightforward way, is that in a way the US plays the role of a world banker for the world economy. Why is that? Well, if you are going to look at the external balance sheet of the United States, so let's think of a country now as having a balance sheet. It has external assets, this is the assets that the, the Americans buy abroad. So for example, they will buy um, euro area equities, okay? So these are their external assets. And it also has, they also have external liabilities, the treasuries, the US treasuries, that are, for example, held by the People's Bank of China. They are the external liabilities of the United States. So if you think of a country in that way, with an external balance sheet, so what we can see in the data, which is very striking, is that the United States as a country is long risky assets. It holds a lot of equity, foreign direct investment, etc., And it's short safe assets, safe liquid assets. There's a lot of US treasuries, government bonds, US government bonds, which are held abroad. Okay, so it's long risk, short safe, like a banker. And in fact, it, from this position, it will reap an external margin, which is the excess return on the net foreign asset position, which with Pierre-Olivier Gourachas, we estimated to be roughly 2% in real term per year since 1950. So that's not a small number. And borrowing from the goal, we call that the exorbitant privilege of the United States. So this is this excess return on the net foreign asset position. But this also will come with particular wealth transfers which will happen during global crisis times. And I'll come back to that. That's what we call the exorbitant duty. And that's linked to the role of the US as also being a world insurer. After all, the US issues the reserve currency. That means it's insuring the other countries who are holding this reserve currency uh, because this, the reserve currency is the only thing that doesn't depreciate in bad times. Okay, so I will come back to that. So there's both this aspect of world banker and world insurer. How does it show up in the data? So here is um, the, since 1970 here until roughly now, you have the net external position of the US in terms of risky asset. This would be the continuous red um, line here. And the net safe position of the US which would be the blue line, the continuous blue line. You see the net red line, which is the net position of the US in terms of equity and foreign direct investment, you see that it is positive. And it has been, it was going up towards the end of a sample, it has gone down a bit, but it is positive. So the US is long the risky asset. And you see that the blue line has been going down quite a lot. And this is the net safe position. So in other words, this is the safe liabilities, US treasuries, government bonds, et cetera, that the rest of the world is holding. And these are the US assets that the rest of the world is, is, uh, is holding. So that's the long risk, short, safe position. And you see it's pretty impressive. It's, it's kind of going, going down this, uh, this safe position. Now, if you have this type of balance sheet, 
What happens when the risk goes up in the world economy? What happens when we have a global shock? Well, when you have a global shock, the asset position, the risky investment, their value goes down. All the, the price of risk goes up in, in bad times. Think about Lehman Brothers. So the valuation of all the risky asset goes down, massively goes down. On the other hand, the valuation of the safe liabilities, that's the risk of currency, it goes up. Okay, because there's flight to quality, and the dollar appreciates because of that in bad times. So in, in bad times, you have a collapse in the net risky position, and you have an increase in the net liability position. That means you have a very negative effect on the net foreign asset position of the US. Assets go down, liability goes up. So a very big negative shock on the net foreign asset position of the US, that's a positive wealth transfer for the rest of the world. That means the rest of the world gets some insurance from holding this US reserve currencies. It gets the wealth transfer in bad times. And this is exactly what you see in this graph, which is a little bit small, but this blue line is the VIX, which is an index of fear in international markets. The VIX went massively up at the time of the Lehman Brothers collapse. And the red line is just the net foreign asset position of the US divided by GDP. And you see that when the VIX goes up, the net foreign asset position of the US goes down. So that's the insurance transfer, and this is in that respect that the US is not only a world banker, but it's also a world insurer. Now, this matters in a number of ways. So I've already mentioned that uh, this external asset position gives an excess return of 2% uh, to, the, to the US in normal times, okay? And then in, in bad times, we have uh, the insurance transfer. So you can think of the exorbitant privilege is 2% as a kind of insurance premium, but actually the rest of the, of the world is willing to pay to the US to get insured in bad time. Uh, but uh, this specific balance sheet position is also important when we think about the external budget constraint of the US. So as you know, the US is a, has, has been running external deficits for quite a few years now. So it has accumulated uh, net liabilities uh, for, for many years on the rest of the world. It's been financed by the Middle East, by Japan, by China in particular, uh, and the US has been, has been a net debtor. Now, so how does the adjustment um, take place in, in this world? So the exorbitant privilege, uh, is going to help. For many countries, when you have an external deficit, what you have to do is to run future trade surpluses to repay for this deficit. So this will be true for the US as well, that's the trade adjustment channel. But for the US, clearly this net external position <laughs> is also very important. And so this is what we call the valuation adjustment channel. These 2% extra returns, they will help to maintain um, the equilibrium on the uh, external budget constraint of the US. And what is interesting to see is that with both this channel of adjustment, somehow they also involve movement in the US dollar. So in the trade channel, it's, it's kind of the classic thing. If there's a dollar depreciation, you tend to see at some point an improvement in net exports. So that's well known. But what is interesting in the case of the US, and it's very different from the US compared to emerging markets, say, is that if you have a dollar depreciation in a situation in which all your liabilities are in dollar, but your assets tend to be in foreign currency. A depreciation of a dollar in that situation means that you have an improvement in your net foreign asset position. When the dollar depreciates, the value of your assets goes up, the value of your liability are in dollars, so it doesn't move, so that means you have an improvement. So for the US, the valuation channel and the trade adjustment channel, they both help when there is a dollar depreciation. And we can flip this argument on its head and say, okay, so if we look at the external imbalances currently in the US, it's a deficit country, what does it say about future movement in the US dollar? Can we use this idea that the dollar helps in the adjustment to try actually to forecast future movements in the US dollar? And the answer is yes, we can. And so this is some work that we had done uh, with Pierre-Olivier Gorincha and, and, and Maxime Sauzé. We, we, we did that with Pierre-Olivier in 2007, and we very uh, recently updated our data um, with Maxime Sauzé. 
And what we can see on this graph is this blue line is the US dollar, okay? And these are the movements in the dollar. The first panel is one quarter ahead, the last panel is 12 quarter ahead. And the blue, uh, and sorry, the red and, um, and green line are a measure of US external imbalances. Okay, a theoretically grounded measure of US external imbalances. And with this measure of US external imbalances, as you can see, we can predict the future movement of the movements of a dollar, not really well one quarter ahead, not very well four quarter ahead, but if you go to eight quarters ahead or 12 quarters ahead, you see that we are doing really well here. So that means there is information in the current imbalances of the US for future movement in the dollar, okay? So that's, uh, the dollar is a key, is a key relative price here, and, and we can know about its future path by looking at the uh, current balance sheet, external balance sheet of the United States. Now what we find when we updated our data recently is that actually, uh, despite the fact that, the, and I will come back to that, that the US economy is actually going down in size in the world, this valuation channel, so these effects on, you know, through the dollar, through the external return on the net foreign asset position, are still very important, so they're not going down in time. So that means that really US assets play a very important role in the world economy still, and maybe even more so now, despite the fact that uh, the relative size of the US in terms of GDP in the world has gone down. So I, I will come back to that. But now what I want to turn to is the importance of the US also for more cyclical issues and, and therefore the global financial cycle. So what's the global financial cycle? Well, so this is something I defined in, in a paper for Jackson Hole in 2013 as co-movements in gross capital flows, credit growth, leverage, and risky asset prices across countries. So this is what I, I call the global financial cycle. And what is interesting about this global financial cycle is that it's negatively correlated with these measures of fears, of risk, uh, risk aversion, the, the VIX, right? So I will, I'm gonna show you a little bit of data on that now. This is just a matrix which shows you the correlation of capital inflows between the 1990s and now for all the different types of assets of a balance of payment, so we have portfolio flows, we have FDI, we have credit flows, across different regions of the world. You have North America, you have Asia, European Union, Africa, Latin America, Emerging Asia. And so each of these cells shows you the correlation between these types of capital flow from uh, North America with, uh, for example, portfolio North America with portfolio Asia, portfolio North America with credit in, uh, in the EU, etc. And you, you see that all these cells are green. That means all these correlations, more or less, are positive. And some of them are pretty, pretty big. So there is a, a lot of co-movements in all these type of capital flows across all regions uh, in the world economy. That's true for capital inflows, that's true for capital outflows. Okay, this is the same type of story, with the same, same idea, and everything is also green here. Now, uh, what is also interesting is that all these types of gross capital flows, inflows or outflows, I mean, when I say all, I'm, I'm generalizing a bit, but I, I would say most of them, they tend to co-move negatively with the VIX, this measure of fears. So in other, in other words, when you have more risk aversion, more volatility in the world economy, that's the VIX, you have fewer transactions in international financial markets, fewer flows. Okay, so you see these negative co-movements between a lot of measures, flow measures, and the VIX. And so now uh, what I did in my research was to try to put a little bit more structure and some numbers on this global financial cycle. So one thing that I did with uh, Sylvia Miranda Agrippino in particular is to estimate a global factor in risky asset prices around the world. So there is co-movement, but how much? How much would one global factor explain of these co-movements of risky asset prices around the world? And the answer is quite a lot because it's a very big panel. <laughs> and actually this global factor explains about 25% to 
of the variance of the fluctuation in risky asset prices around, around the globe. So that's, that's a big chunk. But then more recently, what we also did is that we asked, what about the flows? How much would one global factor in flows explain of these variations of flows around the world? And the answer is also quite a bit. It's 20 to 25% of fluctuations. So that means there is a global factor there which really plays a role in, this, in these two things. And I will argue that US monetary policy plays an important role in driving this, this global factor. But let me show you these global factors. What do they look like on the graph? Because I think this is very, very striking because what we found, and we didn't necessarily fully anticipate that, is that this global factor and risky asset prices, which explains a quarter of the variance in the data, and this global factor in capital flows, which explains about also a quarter of the variance, if you plot them together, they are super highly correlated. So this is a global factor in flows and the global factor in prices, quantity and price. And you see how closely related they are, which is quite, uh, quite interesting. And you can also see that if I plot the VIX on the same graph, there is this negative correlation. Okay, so clearly there's, there's a global financial cycle here, prices and quantities, and negatively co-moving uh, with the VIX. Now, what could explain this type of things? Well, actually, some people had the intuition for this type of things uh, a while ago. For example, if you look at uh, what Andrew Crockett was writing in 2001, he was explaining that in the financial sectors, things are a bit different from the real economy we are used to with the downward sloping demand curve and, and so on. In the financial sector, the price that falls when the supply of credit increases is the interest rate. This has the effect of pushing up asset values and appearing to strengthen the balance sheets of borrowers and intermediaries alike. So rising asset values encourage leverage and credit expansion, so volume expand contributing to further increases in credit growth. So I think this is very much at the heart of what is going on between these links between price and, and quantities here. But that still doesn't tell us what is the source of this cycle, what is driving this cycle. And so part of my research has been trying to find that out. And so one of the drivers that uh, with Silvia Mirando, Agripina, Silvia Mirando Agripina, uh, I, uh, I uncovered is uh, US monetary policy. So here what you see in this, in this graph are the effect of a 100 basis point tightening of the Fed, okay, of the Federal Reserve. On in the first panel, it's uh, an effective uh, exchange rate uh, of the uh, dollar. So you see an appreciation of the dollar. The second panel is the global factor and risky asset prices. And you see that when the Fed tightens, essentially asset valuation, so this risky asset valuation, this global factor goes down, quite uh, economically significant. That corresponds to about a 10% decrease in the stock market broad index, this, uh, this effect on the global factor. And global risk aversion goes up in the world economy. So that's the effect essentially for the, or you could look at the VIX, the VIX would, would go up. So there is an effect of the US monetary policy on, this, on the global financial cycle. What could be the channels? Well, um, certainly there are many because uh, as we have seen before, the, the role of the dollar is ubiquitous in international financial markets, in trade, etc. So certainly one needs to look at all these channels in a lot more detail. But one channel goes through the financial sector and the leverage of US broker dealers, of course, but also of global banks. So if you look at the effect of a US tightening on the leverage of both US broker dealer and EU global banks, you see that US tightening leads to a deleveraging in both cases. So there is transmission not only to US intermediaries, but also to global financial intermediaries of, uh, of US monetary policy. Now, when um, I talk about this effect on global risk aversion, just want to make sure that um, people don't necessarily understand it as a preference shock, like suddenly people become more um, anxious because of, of the US Federal Reserve. So in, in other words, it's not necessarily a preference shock. It's not, not necessarily your coefficient of risk aversion going up, 
But one way of understanding what is happening is that in international financial markets, in markets more generally, asset prices are priced by different financial institutions. So there will be some markets in which insurance companies will be dominant, other markets in which it will be global banks which would be pricing the assets. And each, in other, in other horizons, it could be pension funds. And each of these different financial intermediaries have different effects on different asset prices at different horizons. And so what I think the US monetary policy does, but this is an interpretation, is that by being looser or tighter, it means the market share of these various intermediaries moves over time, and who prices the assets therefore fluctuates over time. And if the more risk-taking financial intermediaries are pricing the assets, then you're gonna see the valuation of the assets going up. <laughs> So just to illustrate that, here is what happened in international capital flow data, so quantity data, between 1990s and uh, here it's 2013 or something like that. You see that among the capital flows, the capital flows that went up the most, that were the most volatile before the financial crisis, when you see this big run up, these were the global banks, these were the credit flows. And so if we think about the global banks at the time as being very risk-taking because regulation was not very tight, because they had very loose value at risk constraints, then these are the banks that were pricing the assets and this is where the valuation went up massively. Okay, and this, is, this would be translating into global effective risk aversion going down in that time. And then if you tighten regulation or if monetary policy tightens, then global risk aversion goes down. Uh, goes up, sorry, <laughs> goes up because the global banks have to be more careful and maybe they are replaced by more conservative players. Okay? So that's, that's the way I think to think about global risk aversion. It's a bit of an intermediary view of, of asset pricing. Now, what does it mean, this global financial cycle, for a um, domestic financial system? So how does this global financial cycle transmit itself? Well, this is where I'm going to talk very briefly about the dilemma versus trilemma issue. So this global financial cycle, because it relaxes or tightens financial conditions of domestic intermediaries, whether we are talking about banks or non-banks, could be, could be both, depending on the period. And because it does so irrespective of domestic cyclical conditions, then that means that uh, and you can see it for any country, you can see it for EU countries, you can see it for the UK, you can see it for Sweden, etc. That means that the exchange rate, which is supposed to insulate domestic economies from this type of shocks, well, the exchange rate, the floating exchange rate doesn't really work. You see that the global financial cycle transmits itself through this relaxing or tightening of financing conditions, even in countries where you have inflation targeting and, and flexible exchange rate. So this is in that sense that the old view of a trilemma, which essentially said as a corollary, if you have a flexible exchange rate, you're fine, because it's gonna be a buffer, it's gonna enable you to insulate your financial conditions and your monetary conditions. You don't have to worry about it, just let the exchange rate absorb the movement, the risk. This view, I think, doesn't work in a globalized world with a lot of financial flows. It is not the case that a floating exchange rate will insulate the economy from the global financial cycle. It does not mean that a flexible exchange rate and a fixed exchange rate are equivalent. No, it does not mean that. But it means even with a flexible exchange rate, you need additional tools besides monetary policy to effectively manage the global financial cycle. And these tools can be can have to do with macroprudential policy, very much so, and I will come back to that. And in certain countries, could have to do with capital flow management. So uh, how do we um, think about um, this transmission of the financial cycle to uh, financial systems uh, in various countries? Well, one uh, type of uh, mechanism I've been exploring here in work with, uh, with Nuno Coimbra is to take a look at what happens to the concentration of macroeconomic risk on the balance sheets of various banks depending on uh, where we are in the financial cycle. So in particular, if we're in a situation with low funding costs and deregulation, then what does it mean uh, for the balance sheet of various financial intermediaries in, in domestic economies? 
And there, uh, so what uh, we have uh, been finding, which is I think quite striking, is that if I, if I so I'm gonna explain to you what these little graphs here, these uh, small graphs uh, here are, because maybe you cannot read them. On the vertical axis, you have the leverage of banks. On the horizontal axis, you have the asset quantiles, so this is how big those banks are. And I've taken all the banks available in the bank scope data, which is pretty much the universe of banks, okay? And this is uh, an international data set. So in each of these points has around 30 banks. They have been ranked by size. So on the right, you have the big banks, on the left, you have the small banks. And we look year by year at the leverage distribution by asset quantiles, okay? So this is, and it is between 2002 and 2013, and the scales are the same on the uh, vertical axis. So you can get an idea of how the leverage distribution shifts year by year. And what you can see is that we start with a relatively, well, still upward sloping, so the big banks tend to be more leverage. This is true everywhere for every year. But it's still, it's relatively flat in 2002. As you move towards 2000, 2007 here, which is gonna be this one, you see that the leverage distribution becomes more skewed. Like the big banks become really more leverage than the small banks. You see this, uh, this red line and you see this blue dot here going really off the chart, right? So it's like we go from a relatively flat distribution to something that becomes more and more convex, right? It's, uh, so that, that what seems to be true is that when the global financial cycle is really very buoyant, there's a lot of exuberance, you have the risk-taking institutions who really, at least in the past, have gone for a lot of risk-taking. They have increased their market share, they have increased their leverage disproportionately compared to the more conservative players. As a result, you have this positive skewness of risk taking, you have risk concentrating in the big balance sheet, and so you end up with a very fragile banking sector because a lot of the macro risk sits on the balance sheet of the big players. Okay, so that's what we seem uh, to be finding in this uh, year by year data, and actually if you look at the time series of leverage, so here it's a time series between 1993 and 2015, the first panel is the top 1% leverage banks, and the, the right panel is the median uh, leverage banks, and of the bottom 1%, you see that the dynamics of leverage is very different over time. You see that for the most leverage banks, the leverage went up massively just before the crisis. It's not the case of a median bank or for the bottom leverage bank. So there's a lot of heterogeneity, and this explains risk concentration. So I think this is something that is very important to understand the transmission of the global financial uh, cycle to a domestic financial system. What are, therefore, if this is the case, the policy responses uh, that one can uh, use to, uh, to try to deal with this, uh, these transmissions? Well, there are several things, I'm sure there's more. One can try to act on the sources of a cycle. And in particular, one could try to get the large currency areas to internalize the effect they have on the joint provision of liquidity, their monetary policy, and also the other changes in regulation of their financial system. Okay, because deregulation has an effect on financing cost as well as monetary policy. So I think one should try to internalize this better. One also has to look very carefully in some countries of fiscal incentives, in particular when they uh, are at the origin or amplify bubbles in, uh, in real estate uh, markets or when they actually, uh, sorry, or when they actually uh, drive, um, encourage leverage, which is the case in many, many countries with subsidy to debt. One can also uh, act, and that's more of a macroprudential flavor, on the financial intermediaries who are initiating the cycles. One can try to limit credit growth, and there are various instruments in macroprudential tools to do that, limit leverage, restaking uh, during the upturn of a cycle. And one can do that for banks and as much as we can uh, for non-banks as well. Of course, one should also reverse that in downturns 
to avoid credit crunches and to avoid retrenchment that we see in international financial flows. So that's for the big intermediaries, which are initiators of a cycle, which are usually large institutions in big financial area. But if we think about the transmission then to more smaller domestic financial system, or it could be emerging markets, then one can also uh, use macroprudential policies in the receiving country as well as in the, host, uh, as in the sender countries. But then in emerging markets, in some situations, it might be easier or more effective to use capital flow management, which would then be substitute to uh, macroprudential policies. So these are only you know, a few things, and they can obviously be developed a lot more, but I, fortunately, I don't have uh, much, much time here. Now, if we think about the way we are setting up our macroprudential framework, I think we have to up our games. <laughs> I think we should have macroprudential framework which are at least as developed as inflation targeting frameworks. And this is clearly not the case so far. So in order to do that, we have to do several things. So obviously, stress testing is an important tool in the macroprudential panoply, and one has to, uh, to, to, to work on stress testing and second round effects and so on, which is not easy. But one also has to get better at developing early warning indicators for when you want to use macroprudential tools, that is to say when risk is building up. And on that, I think one should make a lot more use of balance sheet data. I've tried to show that with a time variation in the skewness of the distribution of, of leverage, for example. But I think one should also use a cutting edge tool, such as machine learning techniques tool. Uh, and I presented a paper at the bank yesterday showing uh, or trying to show how these tools can actually be applied to build early warning indicators that actually give a signal three years uh, before a systemic financial crisis. The type of tools I've been using is about model aggregation. Since we don't know exactly what drives crisis, we have to be very broad in the potential variables we look at, in the potential models of a crisis. And what these techniques allow you to do is to weight the different models in a time varying way and allow you to get the signal sometimes from the real estate sector, sometimes from the credit to household sector, sometimes to the external sector, uh, and they do that optimally to, to predict financial crisis. So applying these, mo these type of tools to France, for example, means that um, uh, what seemed to have been determinant in France for the systemic crisis, the recent systemic crisis, was the housing market, credit growth, and the real economy. Very different models were picked for Germany uh, in, uh, in, in this approach. The models that were picked for Germany were not housing price, it was asset prices and, uh, and restaking. Okay, so I think this is a, a type of tool that, uh, that could be developed. So I, I, I want now to, um, to turn to uh, uh, the stability <laughs> of this financial system. So we've seen, sorry, quite quickly, <laughs> the implication of a current architecture with uh, the hegemony of a dollar in a number of dimensions. We've seen the global financial cycle dimension, the transmission of global cycle to the financial system, the domestic financial system. We've seen the international adjustment process, exorbitant privilege, exorbitant duty, the soft budget constraint. And now I want to ask, this is the current system. But looking forward, is it stable? What can we say? And this is where I'm now uh, turning to. And here this is a very simple graph. This is the, sh the share of various economies in world output up to 2025 or something like that. And from that graph, if you look at uh, the US up there, uh, going from above 20% of world GDP to uh, gradually down below 15%, um, you can see that we have uh, a shrinking hegemon problem. <laughs> the relative size of the US in the world economy is going down, and it's because, largely because uh, Asia is going up, and in particular China is going up. Okay, so that means, just like in the past, you had the UK economy going down in the world economy, and at some point we had to transit out of sterling into dollar with a lot of lags. 
Well, it looks like we are seeing something similar happening. We are seeing the, the weight of the US going down. Now, one immediate implication is that since the dollar safe assets, liquid assets are very much in demand, and global demand for these assets is growing, Asian economies are demanding a lot of these assets, and at the same time, the country supplying them is getting smaller, well, I think that's one of the factors behind a decline in the real rate here. Okay, demand uh, growth outstripping supply growth. I also think that, the, by the way, the, the real rate decline comes also from a cyclical deleveraging effect, uh, which, is, which is also there after big financial crisis. So I, I wouldn't ascribe the decline in real rate necessarily only to this structural shrinking hegemon factor. But what the shrinking hegemon effect does is that we may be facing um, what um, Pierre Olivier and I call the new Triffin dilemma. So what is that? Well, the, the original Triffin dilemma was in the 1960s, and it was pointed out that when you had the dollar fixed with gold, and when you had relatively fixed reserve of gold in the United States, and at the same time, dollar liabilities abroad growing and growing because a lot of people were using dollars in world trade, okay? So Europe was growing and was, was having a lot of dollar uh, in their, in, uh, for international trade and uh, store of value purposes. Well, there came a point where the amount of stock of dollar liabilities abroad was so big that it became not credible that everyone having dollar liabilities could actually redeem them into gold at a fixed price. So there was a lack of confidence in the ability of the United States to maintain the value of a dollar into gold. And this was the first Griffin dilemma, and you can interpret it as a run on the dollar once the confidence crisis became big enough, and this is how we went out of Bretton Woods into a system of flexible exchange rate. Now, what is happening? Well, you see the analogy. We don't have a fixed backing of gold for dollar now. However, we have these safe assets that everybody in the world have, has, all these US treasuries, and we have a size of the hegemon shrinking. And what is backing these safe assets? Now it's the fiscal credibility of the US. And so you have a shrinking fiscal capacity and big stocks of liabilities in the rest of the world. So it's a different flavor, but it's still the same idea. We have a new Triffin dilemma. And if we have a new Triffin dilemma, the next question, I'm, I'm towards the end here, the, the end, and I'm gonna become very speculative here, is to consider, well, so uh, the first time there was a run uh, out of the dollar which led to the abandonment of fixed parities and there was a run into, into Deutschmark uh, essentially at the time, but then we completely switched uh, the, the, the exchange rate system to, 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 to towards fiat currencies and floating rates. So now, what's going to happen if indeed at some point the system has to transition from the dollar system to a more multilateral system? So who are the other currencies? Okay, and it, it can be really many different things, as history has shown. We could think of a euro, of the RMB, of cryptocurrencies, of digital currencies, or even of uh, Marconi's synthetic hegemonic currency. So let me say a few words about that. And it's not the first time I'm making guesses. <laughs> Back in 1998, uh, with Richard, we uh, thought about the internationalization of the euro, and we, at the time, we thought it hinged critically on the speed of integration of euro financial markets, on the willingness of the ECB not to handle internationalization, and on the number of participants in the monetary union, especially on UK participation. <laughs> so, okay, that was our guess in 1998. So now, if we look forward, what, uh, what may happen? So, from the numbers, clearly the euro is the second main international currency. However, the internationalization of the euro has been hindered so far by the lack of completion of the financial architecture of the euro area. In particular, lack of a euro area safe asset. Okay, so it's still a, a very plausible candidate because it's uh, because of the size of the euro area, but we could we could make it much more of a challenger if we completed the financial architecture. 
Then we have, of course, the RMB, because of the sheer growth of, of China in the world economy, but very underdeveloped financial markets. <laughs> However, there we see a clear push of the Chinese authority. We see RMB offshore bonds, we see petro yuan contract, we see uh, uh, the inclusion of the RMB in the SDR, we see uh, the inclusion of uh, Chinese bonds in the uh, global bond indices. So we see a clear conscious push of the Chinese authorities in that direction, but it's still very far. Then we have all these kind of new phenomena coming up. We have the uh, decentralized blockchain cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. And here I'll be very frank, so these things have no, <laughs> no way of becoming important in the international monetary system, and it's not desirable that they should. If we think about things like Bitcoins, it's absolutely not clear which problems it solves, but it's really clear which problem it creates. Okay? It's, uh, it's really, uh, there's a lot of issues with dark web and the uh, environmental cost of these things. There's no fundamental values of Bitcoin, and this is why it's also such a volatile uh, asset. This is why it's also not a good medium of exchange at all. So on this, I, we can completely discount, I would say, with uh, decentralized blockchain uh, cryptocurrency. Now, if we think about digital currencies, which is a different phenomenon, uh, it's, it's a different, so here it's a different style of thing. Some digital currencies, uh, and here the latest attempt could have been a stable coin like uh, Libra, which is not born, but some things like that could be born at some point. So they may allow uh, progress in the sense of being better medium of exchange, especially for cross-border transactions. Okay, we have a very good payment system in the U area, but we are not very good at cross-border transactions. So this could uh, be a technological progress in that sense of cross-border transaction. But I want to say one thing. The fact that you have better transaction technologies does not mean that these better transaction technologies should be coupled with a new currency. It's totally different things. We could definitely work on better transaction technologies, payment technologies, et cetera, cross-border, without creating new currencies. And I would strongly argue, argue we should. And therefore, the ball is really in the court of the central banks and the BIS to make that happen. Um, as, as quickly as we can. Furthermore, I would argue that if we, uh, if we have a proliferation of you know, stable coins or private monies in general, we run the risk that we had in the past before the creation of central banks of financial instability. Uh, so this is not a, a good recipe, I think. And indeed, I just want to emphasize these distinctions between digital currencies which are provided by public authorities and digital currencies which would, be public, which would be issued by private companies. If we think about government issued currencies, and we could think of a digital, uh, of a Nikrona, of an e-euro, of an e-RMB, et cetera, well, these things would be used just like the standard currencies because they are legal tender, and when a public authority issues these currencies, at the same time, it provides public goods. In exchange for the public using these currencies, it provides financial stability, it provides macroeconomic stabilization via monetary policy, and it uses seniorage revenues for public expenditure. Okay, so this is the deal when you have a public issued uh, e-currency or in general, public issued currencies, digital or not. If we think of now a private sector agent issuing a currency, for example, a digital currency, then this is totally different. Maybe indeed that digital currency, Libra if it had happened, could be taken up by, the, by, by some people, but it would be because there's enforcement for an existing network the Facebook network, for example. In that sense, the world is different now than it used to be, because that, thing, that means this thing could become big quickly, because Facebook, the Facebook network pre-exists, it's there. So it could be adopted quickly, but what is the quid pro quo? What is the thing that the private company provides? Well, uh, you know, the objecting function of a, of a big firm is mainly profit, probably to gather a lot of data, and there are very strong possible locking effects, uh, and that is in exchange for providing their customer a better technology for transaction. 
So it's a totally different type of thing. And so I would definitely say that we have to be very careful about that because the nature of the public goods that the public authorities provide are essential. So that's, that calls for a lot of caution in regulation. Finally, the, uh, I'm almost done. The, uh, the um, synthetic hegemonic currency uh, that has been discussed by Mark Carney in his 2019 Jackson Hole speech, which to my, my mind is probably very similar to uh, a digital SDR. So it's a basket of currency instead of being a basket of uh, yen, uh, RMB, <laughs> sterling, dollar, etc., and euro, it's, uh, it's, it would be a digital basket. Well, in my mind, it will suffer from the same issues that the SDR has been suffering from, which is, uh, you know, there's, uh, who is the lender of last resort? There's no liquidity provision uh, for, for such an SDR basket, and there's no obvious fiscal backing either. So this is why the SDR has never taken off, and I think the, the same issue would very much be there for the, for the, the digital SDR. So if I, uh, if I want to conclude, therefore, in, in my mind, so at this stage, it seems much more likely that the world could turn towards a, a competition of the main central banks uh, to develop high-tech international payment and settlement system within a network that they will seek to expand. So if I, if I have to think about the future of the international monetary system rather than a, a, a synthetic uh, uh, hegemonic currency or, or you know, this uh, private sector uh, issued uh, stable coins, I think we are more likely to see a, a competition between high-tech international payments and settlement system. And I would say the lock-in effect, so the lock-in of people uh, in, in such digital networks, given that they would come with data, the presence of data for each single transaction that would be collected by the owner of the system, the lock-in effect may be even greater in such a new system of uh, network of payments, uh, digital networks, than it was in the old type of international monetary system. If we think about the old type of international monetary system I've been discussing with the dollar hegemon, inertia in the use of international currency comes in part from a network externality due to liquidity and all the complementary, complementary roles of central bank reserves, etc. But the network we currently have does not centralize all information. There's no data involved, it's not digital. While if we think now about a new world with digital network, there would be centralization of the data. The presence of the data would be there. So if we, if we now look at the future of the international monetary system and we think that what could be happening as some central banks trying to expand the network of international payment using the most sophisticated digital technologies and transaction technology, what we could be seeing is something like a, a gigantic state-owned Alipay, for example, across countries in the world, which could be complemented at some state, some future state, by something like a gigantic ant financial with credit provision. And that could be something a little bit scary to contemplate. Um, surely, if this is what is going to, to happen, if this is a true possibility, that would require all our attention and some pretty serious forward thinking, as it could have very profound geopolitical implications. And on these bold words, I will stop. Thanks a lot, Helen, for this great lecture. It was illuminating on the many problems that uh, we're facing on monetary policy, on future scenarios, on the various dilemmas and trilemmas. And uh, I think we can uh, now uh, have uh, questions and uh, interaction with Helen. I think you could take questions as they come along. Um, so, who's first? Yeah. Um, please, um, yeah, you, you raise your hand. Yes. Uh, please, please tell us your name and so. Uh, good morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. My name is Daniela Marconi and uh, I work at the Bank of Italy and the International uh, 
on international economics. So these issues are very important to me and to my work. Um, so my question is related to the external balance sheet of the US and um, also given all the big picture you gave us, um, I would like to know whether you see um, any risk of an abrupt adjustment of uh, the US external position and what will be the consequences uh, of this uh, uh, abrupt uh, adjustment for uh, you know, the, the global imbalances uh, that we face today. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, should I, yeah. So, so thank you very much uh, for the question. So as you know, this is a, a recurring question in international macroeconomics because when the global imbalances were widening tremendously in, uh, in, in 2005, 2006, um, so there were lots of conjecture of, uh, of, of the fact that this could mean that there would be an abrupt uh, suddenly adjustment of the current account of the US with massive relative price effects and a lot of disruption in the world economy. And as we know, uh, in a way, this has not happened. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the reason uh, this has not happened, and, we, and, and this, is why, this is also an argument for why today I think this is an unlikely scenario, um, is first because, okay, this, this, this widening of, of imbalances actually is, is, is maybe not as, as big now as it used to be, but the deeper reason is that um, in bad times, <laughs> Uh, what is uh, happening is that actually the people want to use more dollars. So uh, there was a financial crisis, but we didn't see a big dollar depreciation. We see capital flying into the US and a dollar appreciation, despite the fact that the global financial crisis originated in the US. But when is, there is a global shock, as Lehman very much was, that the role of the dollar as a safe asset is there, and we have seen it in, in all these different, these different charts. As long as this is the case, so as long as there's not this credible alternative that you know, I was trying to discuss towards the end, then I think the abrupt adjustment is a pretty unlikely scenario. If we have this incredible disruption that I was talking about at the end, with you know maybe via this digital payment system, etc., that suddenly in the shadow actually develops, a, let's let's say an RMB, incredibly sophisticated payment system, and that suddenly it's scaled up, and the RMB is seen as a credible alternative, then that would certainly raise the probability of uh, abrupt disruptions quite a bit in the world economy, but we are not any, anywhere there right now. So therefore, um, I think, you know, even if we had another financial crisis, there would still be mostly a lot of demand for, for dollar safe assets. <coughs> so the transmission channel is, is, is very different from the one of an emerging market crisis, essentially. The financial crisis has not uh, changed the fact, I mean, as, as you've seen, that the dollar is still pretty much <laughs> the dominant player, yeah. Eugenio Gaiotti? Yes. Ah. Please, Eugenio. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, question, one point you uh, emphasize is the role of macro policy in dampening or uh, addressing the uh, the international financial cycle. Um, can you comment a little bit more on, on the likelihood and the need for policy coordination in this respect? Because would uh, national uh, macro policies be enough? Uh, usually national, well, macro and monetary authority do have national mandates. They can take care of spillover and spillbacks, but just to some extent, I think Mark Carney said recently that keeping one's house in order is not enough. Now with macro we, we probably still have problem even in taking one's house in order, but do we need something more? Is the current institution set up uh, appropriate? Is it realistic that we ever get something more than that? So, um uh, of course, these are, uh, you know, key issues for macroprudential policy. So first of all, I think we have to up our game in macroprud. That's the first thing. And that's, in a way, keeping our house in order, but that means being more sophisticated about the, the whole analytical framework 
around macroprudential intervention and then policy evaluation uh, as we have more now data coming in in terms of uh, macroprudential tools that have been used and whether they have been effective, etc. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done from that respect. But in terms of international cooperation, I think uh, one thing I, 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 I'm trying to, to know to push, but I, I don't have that many illusions about it, but it is this notion, if you believe in this global financial cycle and, and that, you know, the US is one driver, but uh, there are possibly other drivers and certainly the joint monetary policy actions plus the joint regulatory actions um, in terms of uh, affecting funding costs of various intermediaries, whether banks or non-banks, uh, these things contribute to the cycle and to the transmission mechanism of the cycle. So having a better awareness or better measures of the effect of joint actions, uh, whether monetary or regulatory, I think would contribute maybe to internalize a tiny bit more the actions of the different big players. Okay, so I, I don't have a lot of, of illusion, but I think it would be helpful, at least to understand a little bit better what, what drives the cycle and the way it is transmitted. And maybe by doing that, we would discover that actually there's more macroprudential stuff that we could do, both in the countries which are receiving the flows, in the countries which are uh, sending the flows, and definitely the, the macroprudential action should focus on both, the, the origin and, uh, and the receiving countries. So I, I think we, we can do a lot more work in this area and to understand better the mechanisms. So I have uh, Francesco Giavazzi, then Governor Visco, and then another question. So please uh, uh, let me know. Francesco, it's you, and then... Uh. Thank you. Uh, on the correlation between the U.S. external position and the value of the dollar, you showed us a graph, actually more graphs at different horizon, with exante and exposed correlation. They looked surprisingly similar, and trying to understand why this is so, why there is such a little difference between the exempt and exposed correlation. So the correlation between the external imbalances and the dollar exchange rate. So, so, this, uh, so this graph um, is uh, extracted from the, the paper of, uh, that Pierre Olivier and I did for the JPE, but with updated data. And so these graphs are based on the uh, theoretical measures of uh, imbalances that you would get if you were to look at the external budget constraint of the US. So that it's, it's not a simple um, net export measure <laughs> or current account measure. It, in, it incorporates both uh, trading goods and also the assets and liability side of the US balance sheet. And when you construct the right measure and, uh, and you, you use it just to predict future exchange rate movements at various horizons, then as you could see, uh, uh, we have a pretty strong correlation when we look at the longer horizons where the exchange rate is a, is a little bit smoother. Surprising, it's, it, it's identical, exempt and exposed. It, 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 it's almost identical, exempt and exposed. You have two graphs, exempt and exposed correlation. If no, 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 I have graphs at uh, different horizons of, uh, of projection. So one, one quarter ahead, what can I say about the exchange rate? Uh, and 12 quarters ahead, what can I say about the exchange rate? And so uh, when, when I, I look at the, lo the kind of lower frequencies, yeah, uh, it's much better uh, to pick up the lower frequencies than the short run noise, which may not be that surprising. Governor Risco. Well, first of all, thank you very much. It has been a very rich presentation on many issues, clearly raise many, many questions. One question on macro proof. Uh, clearly here you are considering macro prudential policy designs in front of global cycles. So it is uh, uh, macro prudential instruments are devised as uh, a counter cyclical instrument. Uh, many of us think rather than macro proof is uh, more an instrument that can be used for resilience of the financial systems and to make them safer and less prone to accidents. So uh, it is to me difficult to think of uh, uh, an instrument which can be used uh, 
as we use interest rates. Who do you use interest rates as a macroprudential instrument? As something. The second question has to do from the very start, uh, end of your presentation, you were talking about uh, digital currencies, a synthetic hegemonic currency is an SDR. It was a major failure in the 1980s. It was considered, really introduced, exactly the time when Bretton Woods really ended, that is when the dollar really uh, was made uh, detached from gold. Now, the, uh, the digital SDR, which has been proposed, is obviously very difficult to conceive. It needs not only cooperation, but coordination, strict coordination. Most likely, it needs also a, a, war, a world central bank or, or kind of. Uh, this said, the first option that you had de designed, the one that uh, somehow produces uh, legal tenders in digital uh, currencies uh, is a possible avenue. Uh, but your triffing dilemma showed that there is a risk of the need of multipolarity. That is, you need a number of safe havens rather than a single safe haven. Uh, do you think that uh, safe havens can coexist uh, to reduce the financial cycle or not? Okay, so um, three questions here. <laughs> Um, so on the role of interest rate in, uh, in macro, pro so I, I would, um, as much as possible, keep the interest rate for monetary policy <laughs> purposes and indeed uh, make a much better and more effective use of a uh, whole range of macro prudential instruments in order to deal with, uh, with the financial cycle whether, you know, global financial cycle or the transmission of a global financial cycle to the, to the, domestic, uh, uh, to the domestic actors. I think we, uh, we have under-exploited the possibilities in terms of macroprudential policies. Um, there are lots of uh, possible tools, both in, which apply to directly to the financial intermediaries or also to the, uh, uh, to the borrowing side. So in particular, you know, all the, the instruments with the real estate market, which is not as much a problem in, in Italy as it is in uh, many other countries uh, and which has played a key role in, in financial crisis. Um, one can be a lot more proactive about um, what is happening in that market when it's becoming uh, unstable than uh, we have been traditionally doing. And, and so I think I would explore a lot of these, uh, of these dimensions before I would be thinking of, of using the interest rate as a, as a macro prudential tool. So this said, as I mentioned before, I think it would be desirable to understand better the effect of joint monetary policy actions in big areas together in the interaction with a regulatory framework on the global provision of liquidity. I, I still think that would be something really we should work on, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should subordinate the, uh, the interest rate on the, uh, on the macro prudential um, tools, on the macro prudential policy tool. Uh, on the SDR, the HHC, the synthetic electronic currency, so I fully agree with you uh, for the reason that you said. I, I think so the SDR never kind of took off, and it seems for the same reason the SHC is not going to, is not going to, would not take off unless we have some ways of sharing a lot more sovereignty and uh, lender of last resort function and fiscal backing, which doesn't seem to be the type of world we are, we are in, frankly. So, so I fully agree, and this is why in, in what I think about the future of the monetary system, I, I, I was much more thinking about how the, the existing national currencies could potentially become more um, challenge the dollar. And in that new world, the way I, I see it is through this potential new digital network um, that could be pushed by some central banks, or hopefully it will be pushed cooperately by some central, by, by central banks. And this is something that really the, the BIS is going to be, should be working on with all the, uh, the community of, uh, of central bankers. Um, on um, the issue of multipolarity, so indeed Trifin, uh, if we believe <laughs> this new Trifin dilemma, means that the system is unstable, so we're going to switch to a new system. And uh, the difference compared to when we switched to sterling to dollar is that, uh, in a way, the, the U.S. was the obvious big power. And it's not so obvious that, looking forward, we will have an obvious big power, because we clearly see uh, the rise of China, but the U.S. is not going to be small too quickly. It's, gonna, it's becoming smaller, but it's still going to be there. 
and then hopefully we have Europe as well. So uh, that means the, the new system is probably likely to be more multipolar. Uh, and whether this is a stable arrangement or not, we have very mixed historical experience about that. Um, we can we can settle on a very competitive outcome, which may not be very good for stability, uh, and that would be worrying. Or uh, if we manage somehow to uh, uh, to have a good handle of uh, uh, stabilization of international portfolio flows and maybe with better macroprudential policies and all that, maybe we can have a stable multipolar system. But I would say it looks difficult. So indeed, future can be interesting here. <laughs> Thank you very much for your lecture, very interesting lecture. My question um, has to do with the international monetary system. And with your conclusion, you say dollar work for a while. The question is, um, to what extent, in your opinion, there is a link between a policy of sanctions, a policy of custom duties related to the process of uh, de-dollarization de in the world which has been taking place in the last 20 years. Thanks. Yes, so uh, indeed it's, a, it's an interesting development under the, especially the Trump administration. Uh, that the role of the dollar as an international currency has been weaponized. And so this is even more than usual. I mean, it's, it's always geopolitical, the international monetary system. It always goes hand in hand with power. So in, in some sense, I mean, there's nothing new under the world there, and it's actually very important. But more recently, we have a much clearer, I think, weaponization of a, of a currency vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world. And uh, we've seen that with, uh, 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 you know, the trade, the <laughs> And, uh, and the willingness to, to threaten people. So it's certainly in the, in the trade realm, but uh, that can extend in the case of, uh, of the US uh, very much to the financial uh, realm, as we have seen in the past, because there are lots of, uh, of extra uh, jurisdictionality given the use of the dollar uh, by um, a lot of financial intermediaries. So as soon as you are in the dollar chain somewhere, you can be, you can be threatened. And since the dollar is used everywhere, then you can threaten quite a lot of, of people. So this, is, um, so this is a big deal. And clearly, the rest of the world, and especially, uh, I, I guess, in Europe, but I mean, not only in Europe, uh, uh, the rest of the world doesn't like that. And therefore, the more there will be a weaponization, the more the rest of the world is going to try to, to counteract that. And the question is how we get organized. And we haven't, to be frank, it doesn't seem we have made a lot of progress <laughs> so far. <laughs> We've seen that with Iran. I mean, we doesn't seem nothing seems to have been working very well. It's a difficult issue because it's you know it, it goes through the currency, but obviously the, the threat is about also access to the big American market, in particular for financial intermediaries. So it's not so clear we can we can solve this problem very easily. Uh, th thank you again on uh, um, on, on uh, macro pro. Um, first of all, I very much agree with your point that we uh, need a uh, a better grasp, a better analytical framework for in, uh, for understanding the macro effects of uh, prudential regulation and the interaction with monetary policy. And I think the the ESRB is doing some work in that direction. I think we are not yet there, uh, but but uh, but trying. My, my, like, the question, is, however, is um, of course macro pro is. Um, composed of many different things and uh, a bit difficult to to examine in the same um, in the same quantitative way as as um, as um, the monetary policy interest rates um, but there still is an issue of um, asymmetry in the sense that again in, 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 even with monetary policy it's not easy to, to push it up as there's, 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 uh, as people say but I think in in, uh, in uh, um, macro prudential policy, it's always it seems to be 
it, it seems to be, because we, we have little experience so far, but it seems to be easier to tighten than to loosen. So, um, because at the, at the moment you you try to, to loosen uh, macro prudential policy, that, that's, then the discussion becomes mixed with the prudential concerns and uh, and the, the, the way markets will take that and the, the way agents will react to that, etc. So, how does that uh, fit into your idea that the um, that the, the, the policy um, the policy toolbox should be enriched with macro proof? And I have a second question. And at some point, you you made a fleeting comment that uh, the the issue of too much money uh, chasing too few uh, hegemonic assets from from a shrinking hegemon may be one of the issues, maybe one of the causes of the of the uh, global uh, level of interest rates. I would like you to elaborate a bit more on that. that does this mean if we, if we make the renminbi instantly convertible, that would uh, change uh, long-term interest rates, will change the global um, yield curve? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so on the uh, tightening and loosening of, of macroprudential tools, so let me take a simple example where this problem of uh, when you loosen the macroprudential tool, that would not actually be a problem for microprudential regulation point of view. In order to loosen the countercyclical buffer, uh, it's good to have it up before. <laughs> So if you if you if your philosophy on the countercyclical buffer is that um, in normal times the level should not be zero, it should be whatever one percent, maybe even higher than that, then indeed um, you can see it as in normal times this is something actually when 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 when, cre when credit is booming or when there's credit bro growth or when the economy is in a reasonable shape. Empirical estimates do not seem to suggest that there is a big effect on economic activity when you put the buffer up. It doesn't seem to be that big. I mean, again, maybe, you know, further work or further data will contradict me, but so far that's my reading of, uh, of what we find. If this is the case, then you have it up in the normal times, and then that means that in downturn, uh, you can, and, and furthermore, you have it up in boom in, uh, in normal times, but you, you can put it up in a slow way. So you don't have to, you know, to put it up very quickly, you can build it up. Uh, and once it's, it's there, so you, you have your 1%, whatever, extra uh, capital, in downturn, you can release it quickly. And, uh, and that's where the marginal effect is probably, again, you know, everything could be subject to change, but my reading is that that's where the marginal effect is the highest, because in downturn, when the, uh, there is a credit crunch or there is, a, or, or the, uh, there is some impairment in the functioning of, the, of, of uh, the financial sector, then this is where having this loosening is gonna have a big marginal impact. So there is a case for having a non-zero countercyclical buffer in normal times, slowly built up, and a release of that uh, countercyclical buffer in downturn without, you know, uh, having any worry about the microprudential regulation because you don't start from a zero, you start from, uh, from a higher level up. Well, and the question is, will that be effective in the crisis, for instance? Will it instantly reduce uh, the debt of banks? Mm -hmm. Will that work in the market? So yeah, so if you announce, so that's, that's where I think, uh, again, our analytical framework over on macro pre has to be developed, but my view on that would be if you have a credible uh, framework and communication policy where you say this is exactly what you're gonna do, you know, and this is normal, this is a counter-cyclical uh, instrument, and therefore we're gonna build it up in a kind of normal level and in, a, in order to be able to release it in bad times, then this is what you do, this is, this is not gonna be uh, creating a stigma or it's perfectly anti Anticipated and, and that actually may help. But this is, I'm doing conjecture because I don't think we have the analytical framework so far to be able to make, you know, the statement as, as clear as that. But that's my, my, my instinct on that. Um, then uh, on, um, on the global real rate, so yes, so here I'm, uh, <laughs> my own research is a bit of two mind, I have to say on this. <laughs> because on the one hand, uh, I have this view that indeed, uh, if you have um, uh, an insurance model, 
uh, which is so uh, the US providing insurance reserve currencies to the rest of the world. And in, in, such a, in such a model, the size of the US shrink, the size of the rest of the world relatively goes, still demands a lot more of these assets, then you are gonna have a relative price effect and this relative price effect is gonna show up in a decrease in the real rate. So this is definitely a mechanism that I think is there. Whether quantitatively uh, it is big enough to, uh, to really uh, be under most of the movements of the global real rate, I don't know. I think the mechanism is there, and it's, it clearly comes out if you have any kind of insurance model and you vary the relative size of US vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Now I have some other less structural research where uh, I look at the movements of global real rate since the end of the 19th century and with Pierre-Olivier uh, again. And there, what we seem to find in a, in a, in a more like let the data speak way <laughs> is that there are two times where you had uh, similar financial cycles to one we see, which go together with low real rates, and this is the Great Depression, and this is 2008. And in both cases, you see irrational exuberance in the 1920s and in the 90s, etc. You see financial crisis, and then you see some type of impairment in the financial sector and some types of increasing savings, deleveraging, which in both cases lead to um, or are accompanied by low real rates. And that's what the data seem to be saying. So this is why I think there's also this very important financial cycle component in what is happening in the real rate. So I wouldn't put all my eggs in the same basket here. Giovanetta. Well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I found it very, very interesting and, and, and stimulating. Um, I also have the same uh, feeling that uh, I have been part of a board which was in charge of both micro and macro prudential issues. And my impression is that the micro prudential uh, concerns tend to prevail on the uh, uh, macro. Uh, when you build up a macro prudential buffer, in general, given the size of the buffers, the effect on bank is very little. I, I would say almost negligible because that would eat the managerial buffers which banks usually have. If you have a 1% counter cyclical buffer, you would not force the bank to increase its capital. Uh, it would be a choice of the bank whether they want to maintain the same managerial buffer or to reuse it because they think that the, the, the capital uh, they have is adequate. In order to have an effective uh, macro potential policy, which would f really force bank to uh, increase capital to be released in downturns, you should have very aggressive policies. We don't have much experience on this. Only some countries in the north of Europe have been that aggressive, but those were cases in which the countries came out of previous financial crises in which they were recapitalized by the state and their uh, capital levels, capital ratio was around 20 percent, so even a two, three percent increase in counter cyclical or systemic buffers were not making much difference. So uh, again, when you take my potential policy, you want to have, want to be very aggressive if you want to hit on the banks and if you want to have the space to release capital in the outers. But we have, I would say we have no experience on that. And the concern that micro would prepay, prevail over macro, I think is a, is a relevant one. Okay, so I think uh, this is precisely why we have to develop the analytical framework because, uh, I mean, where I talk about the principle of putting up a counter cyclical buffer and then releasing it um, possibly very quickly, uh, the calibration is indeed something that we have to work uh, to work on. So maybe it could be, but uh, we need to, uh, to to do a lot more than one percent and and one percent release. It's, it's entirely it's entirely possible, and it's probably also complementary to the other types of uh, reform that we have been doing on the other capital to quality ratio with systemic risk buffers, etc. So uh, there is a quantitative uh, exploration to be made there. So I, 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 I fully, I fully agree with that. I, I also think that um, uh, one needs to take a, a lot more granular look at uh, what's going on when there is a credit crunch or when there is indeed a problem in the in the transmission of the of a, of a banking credit, say to small enterprises. So what what kind of specific measures there could be adopted to uh, to improve the flow of capital in bad times? 
And there has to be things that we can do by being a lot more granular that targets exactly the people who are the most vulnerable in bad times. And if we were to relax, you know, some things for these people in bad times, I, I you know, I think it's feasible, and I don't think, uh, I mean, of course, in cooperation with the micro-regulators, et cetera, but there has to be ways of, um, of doing some, some good cyclical uh, smoothing there, uh, which would not jeopardize financial stability. But this is, again, something we, we could work a lot more on. Thanks, Helen. Um, and thanks for your lecture. It was really illuminating. I'm sure that people will be following uh, your uh, research in the future. Let me thank uh, the Bank of Italy, the governor, for organizing and uh, hosting this conference, and all of you who have participated to this lecture. Thanks again.